Good morning, everyone. A little nicer out there today than uh, yesterday. Yesterday was we were pretty fogged in there at the five o'clock service. Today we're going to talk a little bit about. Uh, I titled the sermon "Always Waiting." We're going to talk about waiting, how the Jews waited, and we as Christians are always seem to be waiting. And so, what does that mean, and how does that fit with the lessons for today? So. Can we bow our heads in prayer to begin? Heavenly Father, as always, as always, we thank you for everything you do for us, everything that you give us. We are everything. Every, we have everything that you can possibly give us. Most importantly, you've given us eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And we anxiously await his return. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Please rise for the first song. Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We praise you, O God, for this victory wreath that marks our days of preparation for Christ's advent. As we light the candles on this wreath, strengthen our hearts as we await the Lord's coming in glory. Enlighten us with your grace that we may serve our neighbors in need. Grant this through Christ our Lord, whose coming is certain 
and whose day draws near. Amen. 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 be with you. with you. Let us pray. Stir up the wills of your faithful people, Lord God, and open our ears to the preaching of John, that rejoice in your salvation. We may bring forth the fruits of repentance through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Our Old Testament reading is of Zephaniah chapter 3. Sing, daughter Zion. Shout aloud, Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all your heart, daughter Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away your punishment. He has turned back your enemy. The Lord, the King of Israel, is with you. Never again will you fear any harm. On that day they will say to Jerusalem, Do not fear, Zion. Do let your hands hang limp. The Lord your God is with you. The mighty warrior who saves, he will take delight in you. In his love he will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. I will remove from you all who mourn over the loss of your appointed festivals, which is a burden and reproach for you. At that time I will deal with all who oppress you. I will rescue the lame. I will gather the exiles. I will give them praise and honor in every land where they have suffered shame. And at the time I will gather you, at that time I will bring you home. I will give you honor and praise amongst all people of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your very eyes, says the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning. Good morning. The epistle is in Philippians, chapter 4. Paul writes, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. 
We rise to the gospel acclamation. Alleluia. I am sending my messenger before you who will prepare your way before you. Hallelujah. The Holy Gospel is according to St. Luke, the seventh chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. John's disciples told him about all these things, calling two of them. He sent them to the Lord to ask, Are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? When the men came to Jesus, they said, John the Baptist sent us to, to you to ask, Are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? At that very time, Jesus cured many who had diseases, sicknesses, and evil spirits, and gave sight to many who were blind. So he replied to the messengers, Go back and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. After John's messengers left, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed swayed by the wind? If not, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? No, those who wear expensive clothes and indulge in luxury are in palaces. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written, I will send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way before you. I tell you, among those born of women, there is no one greater than John. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Christ. Please be seated for the sermon.
Isn't that a great song? Today I wanted to talk to you about waiting. I titled the sermon, Always Waiting. It seems like when we read the Bible, the Jews are always waiting. They're waiting for a long time. As a matter of fact, it made me think of when I was in the army. Uh, they always said, hurry up and wait. It seemed we always were hurrying someplace to get somewhere, to be somewhere, to do something. And then when we got there, we always seemed to be waiting all the time. So the Jews were waiting. What were they waiting for? Well, Jesus was talked about right at the very beginning, uh, very, very beginning of uh, the Bible. Uh, the other night we were talking about that on Wednesday night and that Jesus was talked about, how early in the Bible do you think he was talked about? Those of you there Wednesday night know what we talk about. All right. Genesis, Genesis chapter 3, when he talks about the, the serpent biting the heel and the sun crushing the head. He's talking about Jesus, that's in Genesis. So from that time in Genesis, if you were a studied the Bible or studied what you believed as a Jew, you know that someone was coming. A Messiah was coming. A Messiah was going to be coming to save you. So you began to wait. So they waited and waited and waited for thousands of years. And then finally we got to a point where the last four prophets in the Old Testament ending with Malachi, we're talking about the day of the Lord, that the Lord was going to be coming. But after Malachi, who's the last one in the Old Testament, 400 years goes by before Jesus actually comes. So they're waiting all of that time. There's a lot of stuff going on that time. That was the time of Alexander the Great was rumbling around the world and... uh, there was, a, if you read the Apocrypha, there was a 24-year war, uh, a 24-year war that the Maccabees were doing to fight their way out to freedom. So there was a lot of stuff going on, but it was 400 years before the next prophet, and that next prophet was John, comes. So they've been waiting, waiting, and waiting for a long time. And then finally John shows up. And so John is out there in the desert and he's talking about he's talking about repentance. If you remember, John is not talking about salvation. John is talking about repentance. Why? Because he's saying your salvation is coming. Your salvation is going to be near. Your salvation is here. All right? That's what he's talking about to them. It's about he's saying to repent. This is baptism that I'm giving you is the baptism of repentance repenting for your sins, saying, I'm sorry for my sins. Why? Because your salvation is near. Again, what do the Jewish people think? They're maybe thinking the Messiah is coming, who's going to save them from the Romans, but they're not necessarily thinking that this person is, that's coming is going to be possibly give them eternal life. So, here we have John out there talking about repentance. In the story today that we read, there was, oh, first I would read, there were a couple of places that there are in the New Testament that we talk about this kind of waiting period for him, that he's close and that he's near. One of them is Romans chapter 9. It says, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many, and he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, 
but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. See, they kind of, the Jews, when, when that was being talked about, when Jesus was going, the Jews should have gotten that a little bit better because on the Day of Atonement, the chief priest would go into the Holy of Holies, you know, behind the great veil to uh, bring offerings of a, for sin offerings for the people. And they had to wait outside till he came back. They were waiting for him to come back and say, okay, I've, everything is done in there, everything is taken care of. So they kind of got that. So now we have John out there in the wilderness and he's talking about repentance because your salvation is near. So in the story today, John, in the gospel today, what does John do? He's been out there talking about salvation is near, repent of your sins, and all of that. And now he's in prison, and he's been in prison for a number of months. So what does he do? He calls some of his disciples to them, and the first thing he does is he says to them, go and ask Jesus if he's the one. If he's the one that we've been waiting for, or should we look for somebody else? Now, you say to yourself, John, John the Baptist, the one that's talked about in the Bible, the next prophet that comes after 400 years of waiting, he's been out there repeating, uh, preaching in, in, uh, repentance. And remember, this is the same man who leaped in the womb when Jesus, when Mary showed up to be with her cousin Elizabeth, who was carrying John in her womb, she said, the baby leaped in the womb. That's who John was. John is the same one who saw Jesus coming by the Jordan and said, that's the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He said, I'm not even, I should not even be tying his sandals. I'm not worthy to do that. John is the same one who baptized Jesus in the Jordan River. John should have been able to hear God speaking to his son from heaven when, the, when God spoke to his son after the baptism. That's John who is now saying, go and ask Jesus if he's the one or should we be waiting for somebody else. Should be waiting for somebody else. Of all the people who should have known Jesus was the one, after all of that, he still is not so sure. Well, people have said to me, well, what, why, would he, why would that be? Well, maybe he thought that the salvation was a little different even. He said takes away the sins of the world. He said the Lamb of God. He said all of that. But maybe spending months and months and months in prison made him wonder, well, why am, why am I in prison? Why isn't something happening where I would be out of prison? So he asked. So when people doubt or people wonder or people think about Jesus, even today, when people think about Jesus and who he is and what he is and what he did, we wonder why some people, well, we get it. We're Christians. We're all sitting here. We believe this all happened. We have the New Testament that we read and we believe it and we believe that everything took place. Why is somebody out there having so much trouble understanding? The disciples had trouble understanding. Why did they not understand until Jesus rose from the dead exactly who he was and what he was doing? Why would John the Baptist question this just because he spent some time in prison wondering what's going on. So we have to remember that the people in the world that we deal with have these questions in their mind also. So those people back in those days were waiting for the Messiah to come. We're getting towards a time where we're celebrating Christmas, we're celebrating the birth of Jesus. We're celebrating the time when Jesus came. But we're even more than that. We're not just celebrating the time when Jesus came. We're celebrating what Jesus did after that. We're celebrating the fact that he died on the cross to save us from our sins and said, one day I'll be back. I'll be back again and I'm going to take all of you 
who believe in me, who accept me as, as their Lord and Savior, to heaven, to be with me, to be with me in heaven. That's what we're waiting for. Jesus' birth is part of the process. But Jesus' death and resurrection is key because that puts us in paradise forever. That puts us in paradise forever. What do we have to do? We have to believe that Jesus died on the cross to save us from our sins. That's what we have to do. It sounds kind of simple, isn't it? Well, just accept Jesus just like that, but people doubt, people wonder, people think. And sometimes they wonder about whether that's actually a true story or not. Well, let's talk about that a little bit. Let's talk about the fact that we're waiting for a time. Haven't there been... Jesus said, when I come back again, <clears throat> you'll know. You'll know. He says, you know, when the buds come out on the trees, you know that spring is coming and the summer is coming and all of that. You'll know when the time for me to come back again is soon. Well, hasn't that happened a lot of times in the past? Hasn't that happened to the point where people thought that time was so sure that they had the exact time? Even though Jesus said, I don't even know the time. The Father knows the time. People thought it was so sure. They gave up everything they had and they went out like on the hillside and said, okay, I'm waiting. Here I am. Today's the day. We got it. It was on September of such and such. And that was the day and we got it. Hasn't that happened many, many times? when people think they have the day down as to when it's time. But Jesus said we would know. Well, what are the, some of the things that are out there that might make us think that we may be closer than ever? That we may be closer than ever to that particular time. He talked about wars and rumors of wars. He talked about earthquakes. He talked about all kinds of things happening in the world. And he said when those things begin to happen, <coughs> The time is near. Get ready, because I'm coming back. Well, aren't things like that happening in the world? Like this virus is making us crazy with this virus going on and on and on, <clears throat> and it doesn't seem to be getting any better. What about um, wars and that? We keep hearing, well, oh, maybe there's going to be wars, or maybe there's going to be this or that happening. What about, the, he, they talk about in Revelation about the sign of the beast. I read the other day that in, in uh, Sweden, people are now putting all chips in their, in their arms or their hands that has all their medical history on it so that everybody can see what their medical history is no matter what. So they're doing chips. What about the sign of the beast? What about all of that kind of stuff that we hear about? So is it close? I don't know. I can tell you one story. Peggy has a friend. My wife Peggy has a friend. And I believe this God talks to this woman. I believe God talks to this woman. I'm going to tell you why, what has convinced me. She got one day, she said she was at home. And I think she was in prayer. And she felt God was telling her, get in your car and drive around the corner. That's what she felt. Get in your car, drive around the corner. <coughs> strong enough that she had this feeling that she got in her car and she drove around the corner. <coughs> Excuse me. And when she got around the corner, just around the corner, there were house, the first house on the corner, it was a little kid, a little tiny kid, a couple of years old, running down the driveway. And as she pulled around the corner, there was a truck she could see coming down the road. And that kid was running for the street. And she didn't see the mother or the father around. That kid was headed for the street for whatever was happening. He was headed out there and the truck was coming and she jumped out of her car and she ran over and she caught the kid before the kid ran into the street. Amen. She saved the kid's life. She saved the kid's wife because why? She's sitting in her house and God is telling her, get in your car and go around the corner. So, where am I going with this? This woman has told Peggy that she feels very strongly that Christ returns near. I'm taking that for what it's worth. <laughs> I believe that Christ's return is near. How near that is, I don't know, but certainly it's near. You know, when I was 
in my 20s, I used to say, I want Jesus to return, but not right now. You know, I want to live my life. Then he can return if he wants and take me to heaven. Well, maybe I should be getting ready because I think I've lived a pretty long life right now. And uh, that's what I said when I was 20, so I, I guess I should be getting ready. I'm simply making a point that maybe that time is close. So what about that? What about that? Isn't it then important if that time was close, even if it's not close, because we don't know when the time is, but there can be a lot of things pointing in that direction. Pastor Rudolph, when he was here, he used to say that he believed it was going to happen during his lifetime. He used to tell us that. Anyway, what about that? That's where I'm going with this. What about that? So while we're waiting, if that return is imminent, what about the people who haven't accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior? What's going to happen when they come back, when Jesus comes back? What's going to happen to them, those who don't believe what we believe, that Jesus Christ came and died to save us from our sins, and that someday we'll come back, judge all mankind, and we, because we believe in him, will go and live with him forever. What about the people who don't do that? That's what we're hoping for, but that's where I'm going. What I want to happen, what I'm saying to you is, while we're waiting, it's on us to get out there and start talking to these people who are not believers, who are on the border, who are thinking, well, I don't know about that, whatever. It's our job to be doing that. And certainly, you must, you must have Let's talk about it. You must have people in your family who don't believe or have not admitted that they believe or have not talked about being believers in your own family. I know I do. Those are the people we have to become courageous. I know that it seems to me that if you're talking about salvation, living in eternity with God, that's probably the best Christmas gift you could give somebody. If that's what we're talking about, we should not be fearful about speaking to people about their salvation, particularly people in our family, particularly people in our family. We've got to be talking to them. We've got to be speaking to them. We've got to be telling them what we believe. And then we must have friends. We must have friends that we know that we're friendly with all the time, but they just don't believe. Are we afraid to tell them? Why would we be afraid to tell them, do you want to know how to live forever? I'm going to tell you, you believe that Jesus did that for you and accept him as your Lord and Savior, and you will live forever. That's what he's told us with him. We will live forever with him. And then what about people just in general? We should have program after program after program that are reaching out to those people so that on Sundays these seats are all filled with people worshiping God and thanking him for sending his son to us. All right? So that by accepting him, we would have eternal life and live forever. So just remember that if you love your family, if you love friends, if you love people, and if you care about them, don't be afraid. Be courageous. Take, take that step forward. Sometimes it's hard. You, some people say, I don't, I don't know how to say that. I don't know how to say that. Maybe you know how to say that, but I don't know how to say that. If you want some words of how to say that, be more than happy to speak to you and say, well, what do you do when you talk? Well, I'll tell you. You can learn to be courageous by understanding, and you must feel that truly in your heart that you care. I know you must care. So care about your family, care about your friends, care about people in general. All right? And give them the greatest possible Christmas gift that you could ever, ever give them, which is eternal life with God 
by having them come to accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior. I just want to end with by reading, rereading the, the epistle lesson for today, which I think is, helps us during this particular time. It says, rejoice in the Lord always. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. We don't beat people up with this. We're gentle with them because we want them to believe. We don't want to beat them up. All right. The Lord is near. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, thanksgiving, we should be constantly thanking God for what he's done for us. Present your request to God, and the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. We rise to profess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Heavenly Father, thank you for the joy, righteousness, peace, and love you lavish upon us in Jesus. Thank you for every moment of healing, forgiveness, and hope that happens in this sin-damaged and death-shadowed world. Thank you for your peace that passes human understanding. Whatever our circumstances, give us hearts filled with lasting joy and imperishable hope. Lord, in your mercy, Make your church beautiful with faithfulness, holiness, and joy. May its love for Jesus gladden many hearts. Let your persecuted church rejoice in knowing you are near. Let their gentleness be known to everyone, even their tormentors. Guard all our minds and hearts in Christ Jesus our Lord. Lord, in your mercy. We remember before you those whom it is easy to ignore prisoners, refugees, and people in mental institutions, nursing homes, or homeless shelters. Help us to shed the light of your love upon them, and also the light of simple human kindness. Help us to speak your word of peace, forgiveness, and salvation to them. Lord, in your mercy, give your dearest blessing to the people of this congregation. Let us be a people in whom your word is fulfilled. Steadfast love and faithfulness will meet righteousness and peace will kiss each other. He will speak peace to his people, to his faithful, and to those who turn to him in their hearts. Lord, in your mercy, <coughs> make the leaders of every nation acknowledge your justice and govern in obedience to it. Let faithfulness spring up from every human heart and your righteousness look down from the sky. Strengthen, protect, and guide our military, first responders, and aid workers. Show them your steadfast love and direct their deeds in righteous pathways. Bring the blessing of peace to us all. Lord, in your mercy, help all who suffer to turn to the one who made the deaf hear, the blind see, and the lame walk. We especially have prayers for Millie Schwent, who will have knee replacement surgery this Tuesday. Prayers of healing for 
Logan, Lewis, Anne-Marie, Nancy, Jordan, Gary, and Denise, all being treated for COVID. Prayers of healing and strength for Susan, Doug, Harry, Sherry, Allison, Craig, Colin, all being treated for cancer. We pray for our nation and all the lives that were lost in Kentucky during the tornadoes recently. We pray for Bob, who was in hospice, and we pray for his family. And we pray continued prayers of healing and strength for Pris, Alex, Susan, Gloria, Caroline, and Lucinda. Give them confidence in you so that they do not worry about anything, but lift their needs to you by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, as we await the coming of your Son in glory, we also anticipate reunion with our beloved dead. Help us confront all who grieve, comfort all who grieve. Make us gentle, joyful, and steadfast in love. And we pray, rejoice over your people with gladness. Renew us in love. Exult over us with loud singing. Bring us with all whom Jesus has redeemed into your everlasting home, where we shall rejoice in your goodness forever. Lord, in your mercy. For all these things, for all we lift before you in the silence of our hearts, and for everything that you know we need, we pray in the name and power of our Lord Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, <coughs> who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. Our announcements for today include you all should have a copy of the white, little white card. Please fill them out and return them into your offering plate. On the back, if you have a prayer request, you know, write your prayer request on the back and it will be added to the uh, church's prayers. Uh, what's going on around here is uh, next Saturday at 9 a.m., uh, please come and help decorate the church. Uh, we're getting ready for Christmas, so we're going into the Christmas mode with decorations. Next Sunday, we're going to be receiving our new members at 9 a.m., and that will be followed by a bagel breakfast in Zola Hall. Also next Sunday at 345, the men's uh, group will be going out Christmas caroling. If you want to join them, uh, it'll be at 345, and we'll be meeting at the church. And afterwards, there'll be refreshments at uh, Ken and Jackie Stockett's house. Uh, on the 18th, there'll be the pancake breakfast. Uh, supposedly, St. Nicholas will be there, and there'll be a chance to get pictures. Uh, there's a f form in the uh, bulletin to fill out for that. Uh, also in the bulletin is the poinsettia uh, ordering form. Uh, as you know, the church gets decorated with poinsettias just, you know, for Christmas. So uh, if you want one, and the deadline for that is uh, December 19th.
We pray together the offertory prayer. Holy One, this Advent season we wait in joy, and we give with joy. Joy for all you have given us. Joy because of your sacred promises. Receive these generous offerings and use them to spread your joy in our world. Amen. Together let us honestly and humbly confess that we have not lived as God's desire. Loving and forgiving God, we confess that we are held captive to sin. In spite of our best efforts, we have gone astray. We have not welcomed the stranger. We have not loved our neighbor. We have not been Christ to one another. Restore us, O God. Wake us up and turn us from our sins. Renew us each day in the light of Christ. Amen. People of God hear this glad news. By God's endless grace, our sins are forgiven, and we are free, free from all that holds us back and free to live in the peaceable realm of, Jesus, of God. May we be strengthened in God's love, comforted by Christ's peace, and accompanied with the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. Also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks for grace. It is indeed right and salutary that we should at all times and in all places offer thanks and praise to you, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and ever-living God. You comforted your people with the promise of the Redeemer, through whom you will also make all things new in the day when he comes again to judge the world in righteousness. And so, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. spoken by the pastor when these elements were consecrated during the service of Holy Communion at Emmanuel Lutheran Church. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Please be seated.
God before time We are a vapor You are eternal Love everlasting Reigning on high Please rise. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen us and keep us in his grace. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Holy One, we give you thanks that in this bread and cup we have feasted again on your endless love. Let that love overflow more and more in our lives, that we may be messengers to prepare your way harvesters of your justice and righteousness, and bearers of your eternal word, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. May the God direct our ways in peace and make us abound in love for one another. May he strengthen our hearts and bless us now and forever. Amen. The will I cherish
Go in peace. Serve the Lord.